Hey, if you're just joining, I'm going to be starting here just in a moment. Uh, bear with me. Looks like we're getting an audience already. That's great. If somebody wants to put in the comment if you're having trouble hearing me, let me know. I've got a new microphone set up and I want to make sure people can hear properly. I am going to wait until 3 p.m. Eastern time to start properly. Um, just want to make sure I get all my technical stuff working. Um, so bear with me about 10 minutes. I'll get started. I'm going to be trying to stream this uh, to Azra's Twitter page, uh, Azra's Facebook page, YouTube uh, for the Azra page, and Azra's Twitter page as well as my own Twitter page. So let's see how that works. I'm just checking to see if the feed is on right now. Oh yeah, there we go. So YouTube is working. Facebook is working. Let me check Azra's Twitter page. Hey, Nabil. Hey, Ron. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Okay, good. The you mic sounds get, okay? You need to get, uh, do I need to get a set or a headset or not really? I have one. It's ideal if you can get a head headphone um, that works better because the Audio back and forth works a little bit cleaner. Okay, so let me get one. Okay, that's fine. We're going to start in about six or seven minutes here just because I told people that time and I want to keep to that time Oh, you got the big guns out. What is it? I said you got the big headphones out. I do. <laughs> you know, I was gonna wear my I was gonna wear my big headphones too, but 
Um, my ears get hot after a little while. <laughs> yeah. No, I just, you know, I have to convince. Uh, so I'm still at home. So I have to convince my son to give up the headphones. Oh, yeah. Playing video games. Hey, just make sure your audio is coming through your headphones. Do you hear me through the headphones? I can, yeah. And then um, check your cam and mic settings on your uh, on the app. Make sure the audio is coming through the headphones too. Okay, I didn't really so, I didn't really hear a change when you put your headphones on with the microphone. Yeah, so it says a camera, FaceTime headphone camera, and then the audio. Yeah, under audio. No, it's the default. Yeah, so choose that and see if you have a different microphone. Yeah, it says internal microphone is the this is a built-in one. The only one. Oh wait, did you change it? I did. You hear yeah. anything? Yeah, it's yeah. different now. Is it better or? Um, it's a little bit less echoey. Okay. Talk a little bit more, and we'll see. All right. Your. Uh, uh, can we make a shameless plug at the beginning for the for the uh, for the webinar? Yeah, we can. Your audio was actually better. Your mic was better the other way. Okay. The, I don't know why it sounds a little muffled. Okay. But you're hearing me through the headphones? I hear you through the headphone and it's very clear. Okay, it still should be better that way. Okay. Yeah, we can do the shameless plug. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. Uh, Ezra. There is something called disable audio processing. Should I no, do don't that? No, don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. And I'm going to log off my email because it's going to keep beeping. Let me see. Where did they put the thing about the webinar? If you put it in the, I sent a link in the tweet. Yeah, let me see if I can find that here. Here, I can text you the link. Because you just put that link up, but I saw it a second ago. Here. I texted to your phone. Okay, let me see here. You good? Yeah, and I can put it up on the screen now. That's the one, right? That's the page? That's the one, yeah. Okay. And then somebody's watching and and uh, just put the link as well on the comments. Okay. Oh, right here? Okay. Yeah, it's in the comments stream from Azure Society, so... Okay. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll just do uh, an open and, um, and then uh, we'll, uh, I'll get you on and then we'll do the little plug for the thing and then talk about the posters. Okay. Do you have, uh, do you already have selected some posters? Or? Yeah, I've got a bunch of them selected. I'm actually, actually, that was the other thing I was going to put. Let me put that in the comment stream here. Okay. I'm going to put the links to all the posters here. It goes right to the e-poster site. Let's see how this looks. Don't drink while talking. How are you getting on our case? Okay. Where Where is this comment? I don't see it. I just see the chat. Uh, it should be. Is there a comment section? Can you see the comments? I don't know if you can see that or not. No, I can't. Okay. It just the, the chatting. All, the only thing I see is, is that chat. Oh, there is left comments here. Sorry. Yeah, that's the yeah. one. Oh, I see. Uh, Erica Bial said, uh, is it being recorded and posted? Yeah, it's going to be, re it'll stay on those uh, social media pages, YouTube page, um, Azra's Facebook page, and their Twitter page. So it, you can rewatch them there. Um, we're trying to decide if we're going to post them on the web page to later the the recorded video, but yes, it is being recorded today. And I tried to post the links here. Some of the looks like some of the Periscope doesn't like me posting these links. Um, but if you go to the Azra Society Facebook page or the YouTube page, you should be able to get the links. I'll try to post them one by one on the Periscope as well. Um, you doing okay me yeah yeah
I feel like I promised a lot doing this this week, and I hope I can deliver. <laughs> no, I, honestly, I think it's great. And the nice yeah. thing about it that, like, you know, this week is is blocked up for a lot of people. Yeah, so I'm hoping people can watch. Yeah, I even got dressed up. Look at this. I mean, I got a shirt that. and yeah. sports coat. I was like, you know, we should do this right. Yeah, yeah. I should, like, you know, I should be. I have an airway shift at seven today. Okay. Yeah. So you're scrubbed up. Yeah, I am. Okay. I thought it would look uh, legitimate. You like the banners? I put new banners up too. These are, I got my fingers wrong, but up there. Yeah. And down there. That's new. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trying to make it look professional. Awesome. Very nice. All right. Carlos said he saw the links. Good. Okay. Uh, what do we got? One minute, one minute or so. We'll give people a minute or so to join. We've already got 24 people watching, so that's good. So what's kind of cool, Eric says hi. Heidi Border says hi. Becky Johnson says hi. Hey, you guys are welcome to join us. Some of you guys, if you want to be, um, you know, I'm trying to limit how many people are on here at the same time, but if you want to, if you're one of our Azure faculty typically um, and normally would be moderating a poster session and want to join in on the conversation, click the StreamYard link and I can try to get you guys in. I'm not going to promise I'm going to get everybody in at the same time because it'll get chaotic, but, um, you know, if, if you don't feel like joining on camera, just, you know, putting questions and comments in the uh, the comment field is good, too. So that's a I'm going to try to keep an eye on that and see if we can uh, answer questions that way. So I am. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Nabil, what do you think? I think this is a great idea. OK. Hello and welcome to the Azra Rap podcast. I'm your host, Raj Gupta, coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we are doing something kind of interesting this week. Um, today, this week would be the beginning of the Azra Spring Meeting normally. So normally, uh, starting Thursday, we'd have the Spring Meeting, and we'd have three packed days of um, uh, of meetings to talk about stuff. And um, unfortunately, uh, we can't have that meeting this year. So we're going to try to do a little bit over the next few weeks from Azra, different types of content and material. And this week, since Azra just released the e-posters um, online, and those are, I think, freely available to anybody. I, I, I don't think you need to have your password or membership login to access those e-posters right now. So um, we wanted to sort of do a moderated poster session. Unfortunately, uh, the time did not let us uh, coordinate with all the authors. So if we get some of the authors on, great. If not, we'll still talk about some of the posters. I'm going to do a couple of caveats today before we get started, and I've got a couple of people in the wings waiting to join. I'm going to have them join here in a moment too. But um, first off, we aren't going to be talking about COVID-19. Um, let's talk about good old-fashioned acute pain, regional anesthesia. Um, we're, we'll talk about COVID-19 at different topic, at different sessions for different uh, context. Second, these are abstracts and posters. These are not preliminary research presented as such. Um, they've not gone through full peer review, so please take all the information that you're hearing as preliminary information, just like you would if you were at a meeting. If you're putting comments up, please be kind. Uh, the, these are often young investigators um, working really hard to learn basic science, basic research, um, and this is a place for constructive criticism, which is fine but there's no role for shaming or badgering or anything like that. Um, secondly, or next is um, I'm not here uh, representing the planning committee or the executive committee of ASRA in the selections that I've made. I've um, uh, These are purely abstracts that I've chosen for my own personal interest. And um, I, I would love for you guys to go to the uh, e-poster website and look at all the good work that's being done there. Um, so I'll put the link up for the e-posters website. So go directly there. You can see there's tons of research there, tons of posters. And the nice thing about it is a lot of them have additional content, videos, extra graphics and things like that. So make sure you go there and check that out. I have no conflicts of interest related to any of these topics presented today. And like I said earlier, if you are an author of one of these posters, I'd love to have you involved. Please put your name in the comments and the number or name of the abstract you're part of, and I'll try to coordinate all that. I'm going to be juggling about 14 different things at the same time, so bear with me. We're making this up as we go. Um, first off, I'm going to get Nabil, Nabil Al-Kasbani here. Nabil, how are you? 
Hi Raj, how are you? Thank you for uh, putting this together. I mean, this is a, a very committed effort and I think probably this is the next best thing to the live moderated sessions. And before we get talking about the sessions, let me throw this up here. Um, you want to briefly mention this webinar? Yes. Okay. So since um, we're all like, you no know, live and breathe the COVID-19 these days, uh, one of the things that comes to everybody's mind, especially if, as we see the curve of spread of cases start to flat or plateau a little bit, uh, we are starting to think like, you know, what's next? What's going to happen when we start to ramp up? How do we select our patients? On what criteria? And probably over the past couple of days, you have seen the guidelines that was released uh, as a joint statement from the American College of Surgeons and the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And uh, we're going to be discussing like, you know, some of these topics, but we're going to actually parse it down, especially as it is relevant to your either chronic pain practice or to your ambulatory surgical centers where you do your um, uh, cases, where you use your regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine. Um, should every patient be tested? Should the healthcare worker be tested? A lot of questions. Uh, there is actually a channel in the ASRA community that you can join and there is gonna there is very active discussion going on that's we the azra to, connect community right the, correct if you're a member you can of azra you can go to azra connect and there's a topic about this yes. that there's ongoing conversation and that's uh actually um being uh used as a uh source of conversation topics for this webinar too yeah. Um, so if you input something there, that's going to be, uh, that'll inform the conversation. Absolutely. The, Raj and myself are going to be moderating the session. Uh, Jennifer Nuremberg, Maggot, uh, Maggot Gerges, uh, Ron Wasserman, and we're going to have an infectious disease um, physician who's going to be joining us to essentially inform that discussion. And we're going to cover both the chronic pain practice and the acute pain practice. Excellent. This yeah, can so happen Wednesday. 429 7 p.m. Eastern. Please register. It is free. And I think I've got the link. Um, this is the direct link. If you want to go to it, um, I'll put it up there. Um, you can find it on Azure's website, but encourage you to register in advance and then join us uh, next Wednesday. And this is the first, I think, of multiple webinars we'll do in the near future. We're just trying to get these coordinated. Um, let's get talking about these posters. So I'm going to get that up on the screen and because uh, they reached out to us, we've got one of the authors of the posters up here. I'm going to get them on the conversation. We've got our good buddy, Eric Schwank. Eric, how are you? Howdy, how are you? And he's uh, coming not as a co-host today necessarily, but as a co-author. And Andrew Fleischman, let's see if Andrew can get on here. Andrew, uh, you have the soft filter on. Oh, there we go. And microphone. Awesome. There you must go. have you one know. of those things that flips over your camera to kind of protect your privacy. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. that's what I and now I'm noticing I spelled my own name wrong. So oh, that's a, yeah. <laughs> not Andrew's first rodeo. That that's not my uh, that's not on me this time. So let me pull up your poster here. Um, sure. I could also share a screen if ever works. Let me just do it because I can control that uh, back and forth a little easier. So I've got here we go. So let's just jump into this. We're not going to do long introductions today because I want to be able to get through as many of these posters as I can. Sure. Uh, let's turn these banners off too because there's too much on the screen at once. Okay. Um, you guys want to talk about, uh, Andrew, you want to start? Talk a little bit about this. Ex uh, I'll give the title out here. Extended NSAID use does not increase risk for postoperative GI bleeding after orthopedic surgery. Uh, and this is poster number 635 if you guys want to look that up. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so I'll just give a little background. Uh, last year, we did a trial in orthopedic surgery where we, we were recommending um, in the randomized trial that patients use uh, two weeks uh, of NSAIDs uh, that were standing dose every day for two weeks. And so uh, after, after that study was published, we thought, you know, we better go back and look, make sure we're not going to, uh, you know, this is great. It's lowering pain, but are we going to have uh, some unexpected adverse events from from what we're proposing. So we went back and said, how do we how do we prove that this is going to be safe or is it safe? Um, and so what we did uh, essentially uh, is uh, we went to look at uh, uh, GI bleeds um, from NSAIDs, 
since we know that kind of long-term use of NSAIDs causes GI bleeds or leads to increased risk for GI bleeds. Um, and the, the way we studied this was we looked at 28,000 patients uh, from 50 surgeons, really our institution, the surrounding institution of orthopedic surgeons. Um, and then uh, we looked for the GI bleeds and we contacted patients to determine whether they had used NSAIDs, whether they had used um, other uh, one thing medications, anticoagulation, uh, antiplatelet medications, aspirin, which we kind of uh, put in its own category. And you can see from kind of the center graph, uh, center figure there, they look at figure one, um, the exposure, there's a pretty reasonable exposure across this group, uh, two NSAIDs. The median was about three and a half weeks. Uh, 50, I think 56%, I think is the number uh, patients had received NSAIDs uh, in that period. Uh, and so with a reasonable exposure to NSAIDs in this group, and this is hip and knee replacement patients, uh, there was only 0.26% rate of GI bleeding. And we think this is a pretty accurate rate because we have uh, a nurse navigator program for these surgeons where uh, on day 11, 30, and 90, a call is placed and they speak to the patient and find out what complications uh, there actually are. So this is prospectively collected adverse event data, even though uh, we went back and looked retrospectively. And so overall, I guess the first message is, messages, the, the overall event rate is very low. It's about 0.26%. These are 90-day bleeds. And then we went and looked at the, at the groups, uh, and did a, uh, a logistic regression. Uh, and essentially what you find is the, the, the majority of the groups, there's not, there's not a difference for the majority of factors. There is uh, an older age to the group that had GI bleeding. What really jumped out at us is they had a higher incidence of previous gastric ulceration. You can see there kind of the results section, if you can see 10.8% versus 0.9%. So over 10% of the group in the GI, of the GI bleeds are from people that had previous gastric ulcer. Um, hospital length of stay was longer, which is partially due to some of these, the bleed occurred in hospital. Um, when we looked at our multivariate analysis, GI uh, ulcer obviously jumped out again with a 12.5 uh, fold increase in odds. Um, GI bleeding was increased by every type of, uh, you know, blood thinning medication or what you'd call anticoagulation. Antiplatelet agents was 3.3 fold, anticoagulation two fold. Aspirin, a lesser extent, which um, as expected, 1.7 fold. Some of these were, were given together. So a lot of these patients receive aspirin, um, you know, normally for the heart, and they still get, you know, river oxaban for, uh, for uh, VT prophylaxis. Most of the patients actually got aspirin for VT prophylaxis. That's the standard. And so some of this is a combination of the three. But then you look at NSAIDs, and really there was no increased risk at all. We, uh, we actually saw a decreased risk of, uh, with an odds ratio of 0.5. We expect that the reason we're seeing a decreased risk with, uh, with the multivariate is that the surgeons are selecting out patients that they think would do well with NSAIDs, which is a majority of patients, because you see a majority of patients did receive these. But patients, but the surgeons are pretty good already at self-selecting. Uh, the surgeons and anesthesiologists are good at self-selecting who should receive NSAIDs, and it's safe the way we're using them uh, today with an absolutely uh, GI bleeding rate that's really low. Uh, and and we, the other factors to look at really when you're making these decisions are things like GI ulcer, since we saw that was a really big risk factor. Other antiplatelet agents in particular and anticoagulation obviously are risk factors. And that was really the big uh, takeaway. Eric, you want to throw in any comments or, I mean, Andrew did no, a pretty I mean, good job. No, I think Andrew did a really nice job summarizing it as the, uh, the first author here. And um, it's a really nice study looking at, you know, two years worth of data, kind of real world data with real application. And it's really a question that I think hasn't previously been answered very well, because we know there's a long term risk, like Andrew said, of, of GI bleeds with NSAIDs and taking it for a day, maybe maybe not a big deal. But how about this kind of short perioperative through a few weeks, kind of the subacute period of time? And it looks like if you, if you pick your patients right. Um, our data suggests that it's still pretty safe. We were particularly worried about that two to three week period because for two reasons, these patients had surgery. They're definitely not the same as someone, you know, that hasn't had surgery. There's a stress response and also the need for 
BT prophylaxis, uh, which obviously on top of NSAIDs, could, there could have been a signal we expected, but, but obviously we didn't see one. I see Nabil, the reviewers, chomping at the bit to say something. Uh, no, just the, the question is, I mean, when, when we say non-NSAIDs, uh, is that like an old comers ANSETS? Is that like a selective or selective and non-selective? Andrew, you want to answer? Uh, sure. So it's all three. So we, uh, the way we got the data, it was hard to, you know, the, we were really focusing on getting utilization data, not just prescriber data, uh, prescription data, which is easy to say, you know, the person got a script for meloxicam, but did they fill that script and did they, did they, or did they just use the Advil in their cupboard? And so we really got from the patients and it's hard to, there's a lot of different names for the NSAIDs and we and that would add complexity. So we wanted to keep it as accurate as possible, as precise as possible. And so we don't have that breakdown, but the answer is selective and non-selective were used. Most of these surgeons are prescribing meloxicam, but still a lot of patients are just using non-selective agents too. COX-2s are all lumped in together as well, right? Correct. Do you know if, um... Was there any information on GI prophylaxis on any of these patients? Yes, um, we did include in the model um, either uh, either form of GI prophylaxis. Really, there wasn't a um, a particular signal um, that suggested strongly that there that there was a difference. But that might have been just the overall use wasn't that high. Uh, but it it showed it, it was a trend towards efficacy with either method H2 blockers or PPI. Yeah, I think this is a question that's really important for a lot of people because we are, as we're going into less and less opioids, NSAIDs become uh, an important part of pain management and without um, data on how we can safely use that, it makes it complicated uh, and sometimes uh, leads to an argument and disagreement about what's the safe way to uh, give that to patients and how long. Um, and so that's, that's a really important part of this. Any last thoughts? No, pleasure to, uh, pleasure to talk with you guys once again. Hey, I'm so glad you guys were able to join. Uh, you're welcome to, uh, sit in the chat and listen to the other ones. Um, <laughs> if we happen to have some of the other authors here, I'd love to get them on as well. But, uh, thank you for, uh, joining in on the conversation. You guys, you Thank guys you. get first rights here. First, uh, first ones on. So sounds good. Yeah, I'll talk to you later in the week. I got to run now, but I will definitely catch you for another session. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks. Okay, let's uh, let's go to the next uh, poster here, and um, I'm just going to put a quick comment. Um, if anybody is. Uh, in the links, if you go back and you see that one of your posters is being presented and you want to uh, speak on it, uh, I will break the order um, and uh, and I'll allow you to present your own poster, of course. But in the meantime, Nabil and I will kind of go over these on our own um, and talk about the topics. Uh, so the next one I wanted to bring up was um, Effect of preoperative pain screening on chronic pain patients undergoing inpatient orthopedic surgery. This is a retrospective study out of the Hospital for Special Surgery, and this is abstract number 616. Um, so the basic premise of this poster, um, when I read through it, is that they have an algorithm in their preoperative screening process to send uh, some of their chronic pain patients through a preoperative chronic pain assessment process and not just assessment, but it sounds like management as well. So they're trying to reduce their opioids, trying to manage some of their chronic pain, setting expectations for chronic pain in the perioperative period. And then they get passed off to the inpatient chronic pain service who assists in their pain management. And then they're followed up as a uh, post-operative. And then there's some patients that don't get that preoperative consultation that also have chronic pain. And they were comparing retrospectively the patients that do and the patients that don't and see how that affects their length of stay after uh, orthopedic surgery. And so, um, and this was, obviously it's limited by the fact that there's um, inherent bias in the selection of patients that get consultations. So that might represent a either, you know, depends on how you interpret it, either a group that's more amenable to change or better access to care, 
or any number of other um, biases that may lead to uh, a difference in results. But it's an interesting kind of assessment because a lot of places are expanding their um, preoperative use of consultation like pain services and medical management. And so if you look at this first chart here, it says comparing average length of stay by age group uh, for complex pain patients. And in this graph, um, the dark blue uh, bars represent no preoperative consult and the orange bars represent uh, patients that did get a preoperative consult ag across deciles of age um, in their uh, patient populations. And uh, overall, especially for the younger group, uh, you see a pretty a remarkable drop-off in length of stay based on um, uh, preoperative evaluation and management. Um, you see some difference later on, but it doesn't appear to be uh, of significance. Uh, length of stay, again, uh, if you look at different types of surgery in this case, um, certain surgeries like limb, le limb lengthening surgeries have a pretty big drop-off. Foot and ankle surgeries has uh, some drop-off, some total hip and knee, and some trauma. So I was surprised to see that some of the spine cases didn't have much of a difference, whether they had preoperative management or not, and I don't know what the um, implications of that are. And then uh, this is by ASA class. So ASA class didn't seem to make a huge difference. So there's a large standard deviation in the um, ASA 2 and 3, uh, no uh, preoperative uh, screening group. And so uh, I don't know if it's just that the study was not powered properly to see the difference here. Any thoughts on this, Nabil? I think you're still muted. Uh, no, I think like you, know, you summarized like you know the study pretty well, and uh, you highlighted like you know most of the high points that probably we would like to talk about. And this is, represents a model of integration of your chronic pain service and the acute pain service, especially when it comes to outpatient management. Uh, a lot of the models that we see nowadays in major institutions like University of Toronto, Duke, um, Johns Hopkins. We see the acute pain physicians are now being extended to serve actually in some of these clinics um, next to their chronic pain colleagues. Um, I, I think it depends on the model and where you are. I tell you, like, you know, in our hospital, we defer to the surgeons, okay, to make that referral. So the only thing that we can do, we actually we we set some criteria for them. If the patient meets criteria A, B, C, like, you know, please refer them. And I think you made a very, very good point about whether there is some self-selection bias because the patient who are going to follow through and go and see the chronic pain doc, probably these are the most compliant patients. Yeah. And whether this is going to be a factor in the, determining the length of stay and the course of their uh, post-op outcome is going to be different or not. Um, is going to be largely based on that, but it's a very nice study and a good design and very informative. Uh, so results. Steve Porter asked the questions, how would trauma patients go to the pre-op eval clinic? I'm assuming this is somebody maybe who's had trauma and is coming back for multiple surgeries, uh, reconstructions or X fix removals or things like that. That's, yeah. that's how I interpreted that, but we don't have the details here to know, uh, specifically. That's just my assumption. It, you know, it did notice, uh, in the results section, they say that, the average length of stay, if you take the whole group um, uh, for patients who did not have a consult, was uh, six and a half days with a standard deviation of 10, um, where the average length of stay for the people that got a consult was four and a half days, 4.3 days, with a standard deviation of 3.3. And um, so you have a two-day difference in reduction average across all comers. There may be some outliers that are driving that change. And then, um, but what's interesting to me is you've narrowed the standard deviation too. So uh, predictability in hospital management is such an important part of it. Uh, you know, if you can predict how long somebody's going to be in the hospital, you can manage around that easier than if you have wide swings of variation between patients. Um, Steve has a follow-up question about uh, were any patients offered nerve catheters, uh, f uh, for example, with the foot and ankle surgery? I have no idea. That wasn't in the poster, so I, I can't. Um, so if anybody who's uh, a contributing author knows that information and wants to put that in the comment, that would be great. Um, but I don't have that information. 
Any other thoughts on this one? Uh, no, the only thing I can contribute is just from knowing this is again as a secondhand information. You probably also talked to our colleagues from the special surgery. I don't think that their practice is big on catheters, but I don't know. Again, I, I, I do not know the answer. Yeah, and I don't know if it was all the patients were only from HSS or is also from Cornell. Yeah. So um, because it's a joint, um, it looks like a joint paper from both places. So I don't know if they had patients from both locations. Okay. So next uh, article we have here, next poster. This is uh, hip and knee arthroplasty in a dedicated ambulatory surgery center, uh, a 2019 retrospective analysis. This comes from uh, the Advanced Center for Joint Surgery in, I think, outside of Atlanta. Um, and uh, it's Northside Hospital, I think, outside of Atlanta. But... Uh, this one, there's two papers that I picked out that ref talk about, and we're going to talk about that next, about uh, same-day hip and knee arthroplasty. So recent um, guidelines that came out from CMS about changing the rules about what types of uh, surgeries can be done as same-day or ambulatory surgery, um, I think this is going to expand the number of patients that end up having that. And this first poster kind of talks about that a little bit. Um, they're kind of looking retroactively at their numbers, and they're comparing. They're they're specifically looking for same day discharge patients. So, Raj, um, sorry to interrupt you. What's yeah. the number of that poster? Oh yeah, so sorry, I apologize. This is poster number six three two. Yeah, and for those of you who are following, I just I open also the e-poster live, and once you type like the number that Raj says, you can get the PDF. You can enlarge it, and you can look at it. And you can look at the details of the posters as well. Yeah, and I'm going to try to put the link here. Yeah. Again, this is my f six arms working at the same time here, so bear with me. Um, I put the link uh, of the poster that we're talking about right now into the uh, comment stream. Um, so uh, the way I read this poster is that they're kind of just looking at their numbers. They're looking at uh, retrospectively... Uh, what is the progress? So they, they saw that when they did a review in 2017, um, they saw a same-day discharge rate of 85% uh, for their joint replacements. When they did a review in 2018, um, four joint surgeons operating at one location, they saw a same-day discharge rate of 98.2%. So definitely moving in that direction. And then now they're tracking... 2019, um, and this is actually looking at surgeries that were moved to the ambulatory surgery center. So not just same day discharge, but truly at the ambulatory surgery center. And uh, the results here, I'm going to try to zoom in. This is just like running the e-posters at the meeting. You know, sometimes the controls are a little bit challenging. Um, 481 uh, joint surgeries were uh, performed at the surgery center, about half and half, knees and hips, wide age range. Average time, this one was, I thought, interesting. Average time from PACU arrival to discharge, a little over two hours, so not bad. Um, two hours in the PACU and they go home uh, on same day of surgery. 30-day um, readmissions, this is a question that a lot of people have. Uh, out of 481 cases, they had five readmissions. One was on post-op day, two for somebody who had a wound dehiscence from a fall. So only one fall, which is, uh, again, not very bad compared to uh, the concerns we normally have. One person returned on post-op day, five for PE, which obviously is a major concern. And then three infections requiring revision, two on post-op day 16, one on post-op day 18. So still below the national benchmarks for most of these. Uh, no other uh, major complications, no need for blood transfusions, failure to discharge, no DVT. Um, they did have two patients that had to be discharged with a Foley, which I thought was kind of an interesting, unexpected consequence. But I think with spinals, that's always a risk. And um, they used a pretty aggressive multimodal strategy. And actually, 83% of their patients were discharged never having received any narcotics on the day of surgery, which I think is a, a pretty big... Um, attribute of how they may have had some of their success. And then if you look at their protocol, um, you know, I, this is not different than what other people have talked about with their protocols, but it's a lot of coordination and communication and expectation and education for the patient, coordination between the surgeon and the anesthesia team, very tight control of anesthesia protocols so that everybody's not doing different things and having different results. 
um, full multimodal analgesia with uh, minimal to no opioids. Um, and then their regional technique, they use isobaric spinals. They said um, initially they were doing isobaric bupivacaine. They moved to mepivacaine. They don't have the doses on here. Um, oh, they do. Sorry. Um, they went uh, doses between 36 to 45 milligrams with the isobaric mepivacaine. And that made a surgical time of about one to two hours. And then uh, they did a, uh, adductor canal block and IPAC block as well and periarticular injection. So spinal, adductor canal, IPAC, and periarticular injection uh, combined with multimodal. So that's kind of how they did their protocol. Anything strike you there? Uh, yes, I have actually a couple of comments. All right. Yeah, go so, ahead. So I, I like this study for a couple of things. A, it's coming from a private practice group, which yeah. is like, you know, something that it's really heartwarming. Every time you see a study coming from private practice, like, you know, that's good. We need this data because this is the real world data. The other thing, I think the debate that has been ongoing, what is really the definition of opioid free anesthesia? I think a lot of people harp on, they did a very, very good job in essentially designing their multimodal approach and they have been very aggressive with it. And they are saying like about 83% of the patient did not get any opioids the day off. But we, what is lacking from here, which again, like, you know, this is not meant as a criticism because we agreed from the beginning, this is just the preliminary data. Sure. That we don't have any information about like, you know, what did this patient do in day three, day four, day five, especially all these, it seems it was like, you no know, single injection blocks, I think, right? So we don't know like, you know, what happened to these patients like you know, after surgery. And um, the other thing also I want to um, um, ask you, or just if anybody is in, in the comments, do you alter your discharge criteria in patients who have tulumni arthroplasty in an ambulatory surgical center, or do you go still by the same milestones for physical therapy when they are done at ambulatory surgical center? So we haven't quite gotten to doing our total joints in the ambulatory surgery center. That's probably coming well. It was supposed to be coming within the next year. I don't know what will happen now, but um, the uh, the goal is that physical therapy still needs to see them and evaluate them at least as an initial assessment and training, and then home physical therapy after that. I don't know if that's true everywhere. Um, places, some places have been doing physical therapy for quite some time, um, and uh, and and so you know return of strength is an important component of discharging them home so they don't fall. Um, but you know, sometimes for some people it can drag a little longer. They do say with the spinal, they get one to two hours of block. So, um, hopefully that's not, uh, uh, dragging on when they're spending two hours in the recovery room, that yeah. should be enough time for that to wear off. One you of the have, questions, uh, yeah. they had, someone had here, and then I'll let you follow up yeah. on that thought. If you have any comments about this is the question of mepivacaine and, uh, TNS. Yeah, I, honestly, I, I don't use mepivacaine a lot in spinal. So I just, I, I, I cannot really like, you know, make a, a comment on that. Like, you know, Raj. Yeah, yeah. I can comment on the mepivacaine. So I've been using mepivacaine for, um, one of our surgeons for the total joints for several years now, five or six years. And as far as I'm aware, we haven't had one TNS patient. I talked to the surgeon about that. He's never had any problems with TNS. He encourages us to use mepivacaine and I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but there was some recent literature review and showed that uh, the rate of TNS in mepivacaine use and, and lidocaine use was actually a lot lower than people ha are afraid of. So uh, we use mepivacaine pretty religiously. Um, I, we give a little bit more margin of error because we're still in a training program. So we use 60 milligrams of mepivacaine and it pretty reliably gives us two and a half hours of block. Yeah. And the second question I think from Iman, we were, uh, we, we already just touched on that about what happened when the block wore off. Yeah, and it sounds like these people did well. Um, you know, it looks like they, they were able to be discharged. 100% um, of their patients were discharged home the day of surgery. And 83% of them didn't require any narcotics. A few of them required some opioids post-op, but that's about it. Some it, chronic it, pain it's, patients. Yeah, it's true, but I, I, I kind of like, you know, have a little bit of like a disagreement with you here, Raj, because I don't know if our outcome or our measure of success should be like with a successful discharge. Yes, it's a measure of success, but I think we should be looking beyond that. 
Oh, absolutely. And I and this is very preliminary data, yeah. but we should be looking at how their recovery is, what their range of motion is, how how soon do they walk, how did their exactly. pain go two, three, four, seven, twenty one days later, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. So that kind of jumps into the next one. So we'll go to the next poster here. Let me see if I can give you the link for people who are interested. And what's the number on that? Yeah, this is poster 864. And I'm going to put the link in the comments, too, if you guys just want to click the link on the one we're talking about right now. Um, this one is from Brown. Um, the it says the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University in Rhode Island. It's entitled Justifying the Transition Towards Outpatient Total Knee Arthroplasty and Analysis of the ACS NISQIP Surgical Outcomes Database. So now we're starting to talk about outcomes in outpatient total knees. So this perfectly fits in with what you were asking about. So this one, they're actually retrospectively looking at um, NISQIP data and the American College of Society database from 2015 to 2016 for elective total knee arthroplasty specifically and outpatient surgery was defined as something having a length of stay of zero days uh, inpatient was defined as something having greater than or equal to one day i'm guessing 23 hour observation falls under the zero day category as well so if it's an overnight stay with 23 hour obs and they looked at adverse events uh, minor serious or any adverse events and they were using propensity matching to try to account for confounding and selection bias between groups, um, did a multivariate analysis and tried to compare these. Um, they uh, pulled out data on 102,819 patients. Uh, now, granted, the sample population for outpatient total joint surgery from 2015 to 2016 was small. It was only 1,099 out of 100 plus thousand patients, so it's just over 1% compared to the remainder being inpatient total knee arthroplasties. Um, they said that there were a couple of differences in the demographics. The outpatient knees tended to be a little bit younger, just a couple of years on the median, on the mean. Higher proportion of males, but just by a little bit, and a higher proportion in ASA2 classification. And this was a pretty big difference, about 7% on the mean difference between that. Um, no significant difference in adverse events between outpatient and inpatients, total knees. Uh, and then af during their hospital encounter and then after discharge, there was, which I thought was interesting, an increased incidence of blood transfusions in the outpatient group compared to inpatient. Again, if there was 23-hour OBS and a blood transfusion, I'm guessing that's where that fit in, but I don't know that for a fact. Uh, I don't know if patients had to come back into the ED for a blood transfusion, but there was no real difference to um, uh, in the uh, uh, admission rates, uh, unplanned admissions. So... Um, Overall, if you look at, and I'm going to try to zoom in on the charts here while you're talking, but overall, no major differences, uh, again, in the negative outcomes, the adverse events. Again, we're not talking yet about the positive components. And then I'll throw up a little comment um, just retroactively going back to the question about mid-pivocaine. Uh, Carlos Pino says, according to Cochrane's study by Forge et al. in 2019 with over 2,000 patients, Lidocaine, mepivacaine, and 2-chlorprocaine have similar rates of TNS. So I think that's the study I'd looked at, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. So I'm going to zoom in on some of these charts on what, while you're talking. Any thoughts on this? I think this gets at one of your, a portion of your question about outcomes. Yeah, I think, look, you know, this is, uh, this is the type of study that is almost uh, what we call the 30,000-foot bird view of how things, how the layout of things we are trying to look for some association rather than causality of some of the variables that we choose. Um, I think the idea is good. The NISQIP database is a relatively robust database for clinical outcomes. So I think the idea is good. Uh, and I don't have like no major comments because essentially it is what it is. You have like no numbers, you have outcomes, you plug them in a statistical models and it comes out. Um, I would just, uh, I put in a, I'm not sure why I, I don't have access to the live comments, Raj, because okay. maybe I did not log in, but I put in the private chat for you a, a link, if you can post that link. So yep. this is a study uh, that, kind of a very similar study that I, that we were part of it, like coming from the special surgery, the group of uh, Stavros and JB, they actually looked at the same 
database, Nesquik database, uh, comparing the, the patients who had zero lens of study one day and inpatient. And actually, like we found that increased risk of complication in the patient who is, is zero uh, days length of study when they were compared to the one day. So maybe, okay, we're just saying maybe, again, this is association, okay, there is no mechanism that we can tease out, out of that, but maybe just the 24 hours that the patients stay in-house, that like you know, a lot of things can reveal itself and you can deal with it like you know, on the spot more than send them home the same day. And a lot of the conversation, um, just so we're blunt and obvious about this, is that patient selection, patient selection, patient selection, I mean, is drives a lot of this. If you look at um, most algorithms for doing out same day discharge, uh, total joint replacement, so much of it relies on the fact that the patient is somebody that can handle that. You don't just pick every patient. Um, and so if you are more uh, liberal with your criteria for patients, then you're likely to introduce complications to that same day discharge surgery. Yeah. And I would just say, like, we're going to be looking forward to see, like, you know, the study coming out in a full manuscript at some point. Yeah. And then I, I'm curious to see as, there t as time goes on, this is 2015 to 2016, as time goes on, how those numbers shift. You know, we went from 1.07% of the cases being same day discharge, outpatient surgery here. Um, I can imagine each year that number is going to crank up, not, not linearly, but exponentially, because the, there is a strong demand to do those as outpatient surgery. Yeah, and especially now, like, you know, just as a, as a side curveball, like, you know, with the whole COVID-19, I think yeah. you, what you're going to find is even a, a stronger push for things to be done at the ambulatory surgical center. Yeah, but we weren't yeah. talking about COVID-19 today. We're not talking about COVID-19. We're not talking about COVID-19. <laughs> Let me pull up this next link. Um, so uh, there were a couple of articles I saw that were interesting on, um, hang on, I'm going to put it in the comments here. Um on parturients and uh, chronic pain, specifically buprenorphine, and how to handle those patients. Um, so I paired them together to talk about them. That link is getting posted right now in the comments fields. Um, and uh, I don't know why it wouldn't post. Okay, um, it should be there. Before we start talking, again, if anybody's listening that is an author of one of these posters, um, please uh, chime in, and um, I will put in the link to join the conversation here uh, to the comments field. So this StreamYard link is the one that joins you into the conversation if you want to talk about your poster. So uh, feel free to buzz in, and I can let you into the conversation. So uh, this one comes from Medical University of South Carolina. The first one's called Regional Anesthetic Technique in a Parturient with Opioid Use Disorder on Buprenorphine. And so um, this is a case report, but it was in the acute pain category because they're talking about buprenorphine management. And uh, interesting case, this patient was a 24-year-old G4P3 um, at 31 weeks of pregnancy who has a history of narcotic abuse on chronic buprenorphine and marijuana presented um, for a lap coli. So it wasn't for the delivery, it was for a non-obstetric uh, operation, but pretty far along in the pregnancy. And so um, the interesting thing about this article was how do you manage the buprenorphine, how do you manage the pain control in this scenario? And they did a couple of things. They did a multimodal therapy regimen. Um, they did give an additional dose of eight milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine. Uh, prior to surgery, including 10 milligrams of PO extended release oxycodone, acetaminophen, and gabapentin. They also um, did a, uh, a peripheral nerve block with a right-sided QL block uh, after general anesthesia was induced using ropivacaine and decadron. And then uh, postoperatively, they were maintained on uh, multimodal regimen again, um, but th instead of going back to their buprenorphine, uh, they changed over to hydromorphone PCA and PO hydromorphone. Um, and then eventually, I think they turned her back onto her buprenorphine, but I don't see that on here. Uh, maybe I'm getting it mixed up with a different poster. So uh, kind of an interesting management strategy for this. So, you know, patients coming in on buprenorphine are complicated. This is an analgesic um, and, or an opioid antagonist agonist 
kind of has both uh, pain relieving properties, but blocks other opioids from working as well. And so they're sort of throwing the kitchen sink at this patient, multimodal analgesia, regional anesthesia, and then continued multimodal an afterwards, including opioids pre-op and post-op. Thoughts on this, uh, on how they handled this case? Uh, kind of a tricky one to deal with. Uh, I I think it's they handled like you know pretty well. I, I just missed it like you know two things. Um, was it, was it open or laparoscopic like you no? Know, it said like, it was. So they said it's laparoscopic. There was no mention that it got converted. Um, yeah. So yeah, so, laparoscopic. Yeah. Have you used so, uh, QL blocks for laparoscopic uh, gallbladder well, surgery yet? But it's not that. I thought you said that they specifically did like you no know, right sided. They did a right sided QL block. Yeah. So if it's laparoscopic, like you know, I. I, yeah, I, so I mean, yeah, I, I'm I not entirely sure what the goal was there, except for maybe the 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 uh, getting coverage to the peritoneum on the right side, or some of the capsule, uh, uh, the gallbladder yeah. capsule area. Yeah, okay, m maybe. Okay, so I would yeah. assume if it that that would be actually like, I would think this is very appropriate if that was an open case and they did a right sided um, laparoscopy. And based on like you know the gestational age of the patient, of the uh, of her pregnancy, like you know you can essentially just pick and choose like you know the amount whatever opioids or non opioids modalities that you can do for her. This is just the only thing that I got like confused about in terms of like you know, the yeah. block that they do. Yeah, I wasn't fully clear on the intent between um, and and they did a QL one, which is also termed the posterior QL approach which I have mixed feelings about. Like, I prefer erector spinae blocks, and yeah. I think that a poster QL and an erector spinae blocks are almost about the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, if you do it, and with the erector spinae, at least, if you're purposefully going there, you can kind of get to a higher place and hit the right dermatomes for the, the subcostal region. And I'm not, yeah. I know there's a lot of debate about how high up can a QL block reach. Yeah. So the other thing also, like, you know, even now, even the description, when they put the QL1, the QL1 actually, by the definition, by the old definition, it's not the posterior quadratus lumborum block. The QL1 is the lateral one. Oh, sorry, uh, lateral. I got yeah, it mixed. So, this is why I so, don't like the QL1, 2, and 3 numbers. QL3 yeah. is the poster. Um, like, you know, I, I QL1 think, like, is was, lateral. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Something I just, I always like, you know, teach our residents, like, it, it's very nice, like, you know, to do a fancy block. But yeah. essentially, you do the block that is going to work like, you know, for that patient. And again, this is not meant as a, a criticism. This is just a very informative like, you know, discussion. So I see a comment here that QL1 yeah. is similar to she, TAP. She was correcting me as well. QL1 is similar to TAP. You're yeah. right. So that's probably, like, you know, that can be like, you know, one thing. But also to address like, you know, her first uh, comment, if the QL1 will cover the subcostal area. Um, I think yeah. in some paper, like, you know, what they do, they do the QL, but they take it, like, you know, all the way and they use the last trip as the margin or the landmark. Yeah. And they go, because, like, you know, that quadratus lumborum muscle extend from the iliac crest all the way to the 12th trip. Yeah. So it can be done as a subcostal and just uh, to essentially get, like, you know, higher uh, spread. I, I'm just thinking doing all this in a pregnant patient, 30 weeks pregnant, just seems like an unnecessarily complex way of choosing your regional anesthetic. I agree. But that's partially because of my own uh, discomfort with QL blocks. I don't, I haven't hit to a high uh, comfort level with doing those procedures on a regular basis. Um, so I want to get to the next one because it's kind of related. Um, Jan Bublik says hi. Uh, hi, Jan. Hello, Jan. Um, this one is poster number 896, and I'm going to put the link up here. And I'm going to try, um, I have to sift through so many posters here, but I'm going to try to put a, a list of the posters that we're going to talk about tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I'm going to focus on the section that says regional anesthesia on the e-posters website. And I'm going to try to do that. I think Nabil is looking for um, the medically challenging cases for Wednesday. So we'll try to post that list is as it soon as we Wednesday can. Wednesday or Thursday? I think we're going to do that Wednesday. Okay. And then um, Thursday, there's a there's a large bulk of um, papers on erector spinae blocks. So I think we may focus on erector spinae blocks on Thursday. 
And then uh, Friday, what I was thinking about doing is doing the award recipients. So best of meeting abstracts and the resident fellow travel awards and having those on when on Friday. So I'm going to try to see if I can find and reach out to those authors and get them to join us on Friday because I think that would be nice to be able to talk uh, to them directly um, and let them present their own posters that day. Um, but, uh, so my goal is that sometime later tonight, I've got to sift through the regional anesthesia ones and which is a massive list of posters, but, um, and hopefully pick out, uh, five to 10 that we can talk about tomorrow. And again, if you're listening, go sift through the links I send you and, uh, let me know if you're an author, either DM me on Twitter, uh, let me know your author. And then I'd love to have you on to speak about your own posters. So we don't have to guess what you were thinking. Um, okay, so let's talk about this one. This is a continuation of the um, uh, buprenorphine question in parturients. So this is from Webster University Phelps Health in Missouri. Um, so community hospitals experience ERAS protocol for opioid addicted parturients continuing buprenorphine improves patient outcomes. So this was 130 patients. Um, with uh, oh, sorry, not 130 patients. This was an uh, ERAS protocol where they were looking at a small subset of patients. Uh, I think they had a total of 21 patients, 15 in their controlled non-ERAS protocol and six in their um, ERAS protocol group. And the ERAS protocol for these patients um, were uh, a combination of preoperative uh, management, uh, including continuing their buprenorphine, plan for a combined spinal epidural with intrathecal morphine and continuous tap blocks. Um, and then they used intraoperatively uh, the combination of the epidural spinal um, and uh, minimal use of the tap blocks during the case. They did give some NSAIDs and uh, antiemetics. And then postoperatively, they continued on Celebrex, gabapentin, um, some Toradol as needed. Epidural infusion was running, but they also bolus the tap blocks periodically and then eventually transitioned to just the tap blocks and got rid of the epidurals. And the goal was to look at their outcomes um, from, uh, from the difference in management. And so I'm gonna try to zoom in here so you guys can see the details. So no statistically significant difference found uh, in their demographics between the two groups. But what they did see was um, if you look at the chart on the right, uh, overall opioid consumption in oxycodone equivalents, the blue bars are the patients who got the ERAS protocol, which they call their mission protocol, and the orange bars are the patients in the control group, which didn't get the protocol. Quite a big drop-off in opioid consumption between the two, and, uh, you know, if you look at the high bars here uh, on post-op day zero, some of the patients were getting 50 milligram equivalents of oxycodone in a day. Uh, that's quite a bit. And then, um, and then post-operative pain scores also tracked lower for the patients who were in the protocol versus the ones who weren't. Uh, the, some of the other results that were kind of interesting, um, uh, the infants, uh, sorry, not the infants, that's not what I, um, more likely to breastfeed. So the infants born to the ERAS protocol mothers, uh, were, um, Four out of the six of them were able to breastfeed versus only two out of the 15 in the control group. And then remember, these are high-risk patient populations. So these are high opioid risk patients who are already on chronic opioids. The statistic that really bugged me, and I couldn't quite figure out what to make of it, was um, in the control group, the 15, 10 out of the 15, the infants were taking into state custody at the end of the uh, at discharge and i'm assuming that was because the parents the mothers uh, were not able to care for the patients and then a hundred percent of the patients in the eras treated group were able to retain custody of their infants i'm not sure what to make of that part of the equation um, and then you guys can see the the detailed table here in the middle uh, let me just see if uh, i have any comments here Uh, we may have some authors coming. Okay, some comments about mipivacaine still. We'll get back to that at the end. Okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead. What do you think? I, I think, uh, like, A, like, you know, that to take the effort to just put something together and just do statistics and do the protocol together, this 
definitely should be commended. Is it just as absolutely? It would have been like you know a lot better if we can probe into what the author's minds. But to me, like you know, when you're coming for a C section and you have a CSC and then you have it like a bilateral tap block with casters, and then on top of that you have the multimodal. I don't know. What do you think? Don't you think that's a little bit like you know, too much for a multimodal? I was thinking that too. So yeah. I was thinking that too. So I don't do just as full disclosure. I don't uh, do OB anymore. Um, I obviously talk to our OB colleagues frequently, but I don't do OB myself. Um, what strikes me is that these are high risk patients. So these are already patients that were um, uh, chronic opiate history of abuse on um, buprenorphine to begin with. Um, and, uh, how they handle pain in the peripartum period is going to be directly tied to their recovery and their infant's recovery. So there's mm -hmm. two components to that, right? And so I think uh, this puts them into a category where extra effort um, may be necessary. And Eric asks the question, you know, seems like this would require a lot of time. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, if we invest the time on the front end, do we get the benefit on the back end? where, um, you know, if they've dropped off all opioids by post-op day zero and not using any oral opioids for the next uh, remaining three or four days, that's a pretty big win, uh, I think, and may justify the investment of time. You're not going to, every patient's not going to be like this, but, um, uh, but uh, you know, that's, that's definitely maybe worth the effort. Uh, Becky Johnson just put on here, uh, you know, local anesthetic toxicity considerations, especially with increased sensitivity, sensitivity local during pregnancy. Yeah, that's a real concern. You're running two tap blocks and an epidural. You got to be doing your calculations correctly. So any other thoughts on that one? Uh, no, I think like when you put it that way, especially if, uh, if this patient has been already on medication assisted treatment, like, you know, yes, I guess like you can justify it, but you have to time it like, you know, very correctly and you have to do a lot of math to make sure that you stay below the toxic doses of low kind of things. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think it does require a yeoman's effort to take care of some of these complex patients, but it sounds True. like there is some evidence that it pays off. The question is, can it be sustained uh, yeah. on a regular basis? And, and we do have to be careful when you push somebody this hard. Yeah. And I, I'm also, I'm not like, you know, I don't do OB like more frequently as well, but yeah. I know in the OB world, like, you know, intrathecal morphine is king, right? So yeah. I'm, not, I'm yeah. not sure, like, you know, when you are on medication assisted treatment and you get the, the your opioid through intrathecal, does the substantial gelatinose in the spinal column, like, you know, are you also, it's not going to be as effective or it has like, you no know, different pathway of action, different mechanism. These are questions I don't know the answer for. Yeah. It's still interesting. I, I, I really yeah. commend these people for trying to spend Absolutely. that. I mean, we, a lot of people Absolutely. run ERAS protocols yes. and don't Absolutely. really look backwards and see what happened. Yes, you know? yes, yes, yes. So, um, and uh, Tiffany, I did see your uh, comment here about Friday. Um, thank you so much for reaching out to me. And um, I will be emailing you uh, to coordinate that timing uh, soon. Okay, thank you. All right, let me go back. Um, I think we can do three or four more posters and then wrap up. I've, uh, we're a little bit over time, but um, you okay for time? I am okay. Okay. I, there's so many posters, like I just feel bad cutting people off and not even talking about their stuff, but um, hopefully some of them get to see us talking about their material. Okay, um, this one is poster number 771. Um, so let me get that link up here. This goes back to the question of quadratus lumborum block. I thought that's, you know, it's it's another one of the hot topics right now. And so, um, uh, I, I, you know, these fascial plane blocks of different types, everybody's trying to figure out a new way to push the envelope on this. So this one is coming from UPMC. So your, your neighbors, not too far. Um, single quadratus lumborum block plus IV lidocaine infusion versus continuous quadratus lumborum block for abdominal surgery. So in this one, they, they randomized people to, and again, this is not a prospective study. This was a retrospective study. So uh, let me correct that. They didn't randomize people 
um, to different therapies. They retroactively looked at people who chose some patients to get um, single shot block with quadratus lumborum with an IV drip of lidocaine or continuous quadratus lumborum block. And um, these are for major abdominal surgery, and they were trying to see if there was any difference in outcomes between the two groups. Um, and they were looking at opioid consumption at 24, 48, and 72 hours after surgery, um, reported as IV morphine equivalents, and then also looking at non-opioid analgesic consumption at those same time frames. So acetaminophen, dexmedetomidine, and ketamine, and ketorolac. And in this, they were just using their uh, registry to go back, and they found 54 patients who underwent major abdominal surgery with their ERAS protocol and received one of those two therapies. Um, and they pulled their demographic data and all their pain data. And in this study, um, basically what they saw was that there was no real difference in outcomes. There were a couple of subtleties that I wanted to go over if I pull in on the chart here. See if I can pull that chart in a little bit better. So a couple of the subtleties that I saw. So in this top uh, table, you see the continuous quadratus lumborum block in the top here with the median uh, value uh, in the middle, and then this uh, single shot quadratus lumborum with IV lidocaine. And they have pain scores in the first three columns and morphine IV equivalents in the second three columns um, over here. And most everything tracked about the same. Uh, the, on 24 to 48 hours, and then, um, a little bit into 48 to 72 hours, the, uh, su a single shot quadratus lumborum with IV lidocaine had quite a, uh, or somewhat less morphine equivalence, uh, usage. So 2.4 versus 7.6. Now, you know, how much the difference is five milligrams? Uh, I, I don't know if we would make a huge deal about that, but. Um, there was a little bit of difference there. And then in the second uh, chart uh, down below, looking at all the other um, non-opioid medications, uh, not much in the way of differences, little variation in ketamine doses availability. I'm guessing they had ketamine infusions for post-op pain as well in these patients. And then for some reason, the single-shot QL blocks with IV lidocaine got more tortol than um, the other group, but I don't know if that was a protocol difference or just chance. So a, a little bit of preliminary data in this, but uh, kind of tracking that the simpler solution of single shot QL with an IV lidocaine infusion may be just as good as going through the effort of um, doing the continuous infusion. Yeah, and actually it's interesting, like, you know, if you look at the pain score with that single shot, yeah. It, at 24 and 48 and 48 and 70, it's actually, it's actually less than the pain scores in the continuous group. So I see, um, are you looking at media? So this is the, the first row is count. So that's yeah, so, the that's yeah. the number of patients, I think. So, yeah, so they count. So, but then the next one is the median. So that's median. the median. So it's, for, I think it's the same. It's five and five, four and four, four and four. Is it the median for the number or the median for the pain scores? I think that's the median for the pain scores, right? Yeah. So that's 2.4 and opposite to 7.6 for the continuous group. So the, the continuous group did a lot worse. Am I looking at the wrong thing? Um, Where are you looking? I'm looking in the middle table uh, when it says MIV. Oh, yeah. Right? The morphine equivalents. So that's the IV morphine equivalents, not yeah. pain scores. So no. in that one, the 2.4 to 7.6, is that the comparison you're making? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. so that's that's five milligrams of morphine difference in a in a twenty four hour period. I'm not yeah. sure if I would bank on that too much, um, and uh, you know, but you know, it is something. It is yeah. something to look at. No, it, it's it's very very interesting. You know what would yeah. be even like you know more interesting, and again like you know this is like you know, a very nice design. Will be even like you know a, a lot more interesting if you have a third group without like you know the quadratus lumborum block at all. And just have the IV lidocaine infusion. And have just the IV lidocaine and all the other multimodal analgesics. Uh, so Becky Johnson's got the same thought as you, which is she just put that same thing in the comments. Yeah. Um, and then the the other the other question, I guess, if you flip it around, is maybe the single shot is equivalent to the continuous infusion for the QL block. 
So you could have four or five different arms depending on which combination permutation you wanted to put on there. Exactly. And uh, Iman also uh, put on here that the evidence about IV lidocaine is not great. Um, yeah, that's still mixed. A um, lot of lot of difference of uh, data out there. Okay, um, let's do this one just because I think it's really pretty. Um, I, I, you know, we, we posted uh, some examples of how to do a more modern poster and um, uh, Veeple's group uh, at Dalhousie University, they, they did a really good job. Uh, oh, sorry, not Veeple, Vishal's, Vishal's group um, in Dalhousie University. They did a really good job of making a modern looking poster. Any of you guys who are out there, start making your posters look like this. They're going to stand out. People are going to look. They're going to get the point really fast. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think that's um, should be uh, commended. So we'll finish up with this poster. This is poster number 870. Uh, let me put the link up here. Oops, I hit the wrong button. This is... Okay, so here's the link. Um, so this is called Risk Factors for Severe Pain After Peripheral Nerve Block for Ambulatory Surgery. Um, and again, th so this is the issue where people are getting blocks and having surgery, but then they have rebound pain or uh, significant pain afterwards. So this was a retrospective study. Um, they looked at severe post-op pain within the first 24 to 48 hours after ambulatory orthopedic and plastic surgery. Um, or sorry, I think this was, yeah, or orthopedic or plastic surgery. Um, they had uh, a variety of different factors, patient, anesthetic, and surgical factors. Um, they were looking primarily at pain scores within 24 hours after the nerve block wore off. And, um, and then they chose variables based on what they saw as differences. Um, if you look at the nice big infograph in the middle, um, the variables that they found that were higher risk of severe pain after peripheral nerve block wore off, bone surgery, which isn't too much of a surprise, that odds ratio of 1.8 um, for bone surgery. Younger age was actually a higher risk of severe pain. Not a huge difference, but still falls under the confidence interval. So an odds ratio of 0.98 per year of age where you have less pain over... Uh, increasing age time. Upper limb surgery had a higher risk, uh, odds ratio 1.59, and then female gender, odds ratio 1.63. A lot of other things were not seen as independent variables um, for increased risk of pain. All of those things are what they call non-modifiable uh, risk factors, either patient risk factors or surgical risk factors. So you can't really do anything about your age or where you're having surgery or your gender. The one thing they did notice that was different was the use of IV dexamethasone. Um, and the odds ratio of having increased pain after the nerve block wore off was 1.79 if you didn't get IV dexamethasone. So you had less pain if you got IV dexamethasone. So that was the one thing that they found was a modifiable risk. Now, they didn't talk about other things like continuous nerve catheters or other adjuvants to prolong nerve blocks or the timing of oral pain medication, but those things could also contribute. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, this is our I, wheelhouse, right? Yeah, but, but I just, I have to say, just I have to preface that, that I'm biased. I'm biased, and uh, this is going to be probably controversial for the use of perineural dexamethasone. And well, they that... say they say IV dexamethasone, so they don't discuss perineural dexamethasone in this okay. yeah. specific so, poster. But... Yeah, okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, but uh, again, I have just declared my bias. I think dexamethasone <laughs> is one of the of the excellent drugs that you can use in whatever routes, like you know, whether you give it IV or you give it perineural. And I think like you know, perineural, it's a lot more effective. And like you know, that phenomena that, that you are seeing with the dexamethasone, you can compare it actually in the animal. It is uh, one animal study. Uh, yeah, and I think it's maybe just maybe two. Like you know, one was from our group, and the other one I think I think from Pittsburgh, but I'm not sure. We're showing like you know a similar phenomena for the uh, thermal rebound pain, like you know in uh, rats. Okay, when you put like you know, dexamethasone with the peripheral nerve blocks. 
Um, the other thing, just like they didn't make any comment about the multimodal LLDs yet. They yeah, I mean, they've simplified, they, they yeah. have simplified this analysis, that's exactly. for sure. But so that's multimodal okay. is a big thing. Uh, patient education is a big thing. And honestly, like in one of the variables that I think is, uh, that I see a little bit uh, kind of surprising, I would assume that probably male gender is going to be probably worse, like you know, when it comes to the rebound pain. Hmm. Yeah, that was, um, I, I, it says an odds ratio of 1.63 for females having worse pain. Yeah. Um, it seems pretty high to me. I didn't think there would be that much difference. Um, uh, I, I thought of it as pretty much the same, that other variables would play a larger factor than gender. Yeah. Um, but uh, so it'd be interesting to tease that out a little bit more. So yeah. going back to the dexamethasone thing, so if Chad Brummett was watching, he'd yell at us and um, and say, no, 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 IV dexamethasone is exactly the same as perineural dexamethasone. It has no difference whatsoever. And um, I think a lot of the problem is is that uh, we haven't always used preservative-free IV dexam I mean, perineural dexamethasone. Um, we've, uh, you know, at different dosage, uh, different techniques for doing the blocks, whereas IV dexamethasone is a pretty consistent delivery mechanism. The other thing is that years ago when we did a retrospective analysis of our patient population at an ambulatory surgery center, we had looked at about 15,000 patients and saw what dexamethasone was doing to our patients. And we weren't, granted, we weren't using preservative-free dexamethasone. But at that time, the, um, uh, the uh, dexamethasone was causing huge variations in duration of the block. So, you know, when we looked at the averages, we saw four to six hours. But um, when we looked at the, uh, the, the range, we had ranges of, you know, sometimes it extended the block like an hour, sometimes two days. We had, we had outliers that, you know, another 48 hours longer than the normal block would last. And so dexamethasone perineurally made me nervous at that time. Again, preservative-free, but um, we, we didn't have preservative-free at the time, but that may make the difference as if we're using preservative-free or not. Yeah. And Hari, I tried to reach out to him, but a little bit late, and uh, I, I couldn't get a response from Vishal in time yeah. to get him on here. But yeah. Raj, can, can you put up this link, please? Yeah, I'm getting it. Put it in the it. private chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, is this your paper? That's our paper. And this is, I know this is, it seems and it sounds like a shameless plug, but I'm just putting it to make the point. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, just disclose and keep going. Yeah, I did. Okay, yeah. I did initially. And <laughs> I, I, I use it. And actually, a lot of my own partners in my own group like would not use uh, perineural dexamethasone. But uh, I do. And I think at the end of the day that we are a product of our reading of the literature and our biases. Okay, so that's one of my biases. Yeah. Let me see if I can pull up that article. I don't know if it'll come up for me. I'm on my home network, so I don't know if this will pull up or not. Yeah, that's it. Uh... So it, it's actually, we found that when you give it perineural, so the perineural was compared to the also the systemic dexamethasone, and the perineural administration was protective. When you took the sciatic nerve of the mice and you look at them under the microscope, there yeah. were less uh, apoptosis of the nerve cells. Than, with the dexamethasone? Uh, with the perineural dexamethasone. Hmm versus the systemic dexamethasone. And the whole thing was the, about the thermal uh, hyperalgesia, the phenomena. Mm -hmm. And the PI on that, uh, actually the senior author was J.B. Liu. He's now at the special surgery. But I will tell you, like, you know, he probably, like, you know, I have been there, like, when we were doing this study. Um, I, I don't know, like, you know, if he's adopting, like, you know, the perineural dexamethasone, like, not that much. But I, 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 I agree, like, you know, with this paper, that dexamethasone may have like you no know, a role in blunting like you no know, the rebound effect of uh, after peripheral blocks. So because our friend, if, if so you our assume friend this is an inflammatory response, so yeah, maybe yeah. The, like you know the anti-inflammatory effect like you know, may have something to do with that. So um, our friend Dr. Mohammed in Israel says, what about using beta methasone? Uh, he says he's observed prolongation of the blocks too. I've never used beta methasone for. I've never block. used it either. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any comment on that. Sorry. And then we and, have somebody from Brazil. Yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Vesperez, uh, yes. Marcelo Vesperez, 
Um, he says, we do it here in Brazil, perineural for chronic pain, but not for acute pain. Now, that's interesting. Um, I wonder if there's a higher uh, incidence of, you know, inflammatory process going on in a chronic pain patient. And maybe yeah, that's but they do it for all the epidural and the transfrominal injections. The yeah, that's true. The yeah, steroids pain. have been used forever for those. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and again, we're learning in the acute pain world, they've always used preservative-free steroids. Correct. And I think we need to move to that as well. Yeah, and so, for disclosure, also all the dexamethasone that we use in our practice is preservative-free. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to quickly show the posters of the other ones that uh, uh, we're not going to have a chance to talk about. Uh, Iman, the poster, the the paper, the, I don't know the if you're talking about account. the poster or the paper. The link is in the, the comments there, and you can get to Dr. Nabil's uh, paper there. Um so the other ones I just wanted to talk about uh, and mention, because I thought they were interesting, this is poster number 969, sublingual sufentanil versus intravenous fentanyl for acute pain in the ambulatory surgery center. They didn't really see any difference between the two, kind of advocating that sublingual sufentanil may be safe and effective uh, as a post-operative pain therapy. Uh, we'll leave that open for comments right now. Um, another one was pediatric post-operative opioid use at hospital for special surgery. Uh, our, our friend, uh, Knoops was part of this. Um, and, uh, this is poster number 970 and their basic, uh, premise was that, um, how many opioid pills you send somebody home with will affect how many opioid pills they consume. Um, and they had two groups, one that got 20 pills and one got 40 pills most of the people stopped taking pills within a few days after surgery, and the people who had more pills to go home with used more pills and also had more left over. So advocating for the distribution of smaller amounts, but this also in a pediatric population instead of the adult population. And then uh, the last one was poster number 990. Does preoperative marijuana use affect postoperative outcomes after total knee arthroplasty? This comes from St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center in Hartford, Connecticut. This one was really interesting because actually in this one, the patients who routinely used marijuana before surgery um, had higher morphine usage in the perioperative period. Um, and then uh, at one year post knee replacement, uh, had 6.3% uh, of them had very unsatisfied ratings of their experience after knee replacement versus 1.1% in the patients that didn't use marijuana. What do you make of it? I don't know. I, I don't know how to interpret that um, because there's so many confounders in that, um, that those patient populations, I don't know how to interpret that, but it's kind of interesting that it's not obvious that people who use and continue to use marijuana as a part of their pain therapy um, will they actually use less opioids? And I'm not sure if this uh, uh, tells us enough about it, but it's an interesting point of uh, information. So those are the ones I had picked out today. Um, not bad for our first shot at this uh, virtual moderated poster session. Um, you know, again, we're this was all last minute, so uh, I know it was hard to get authors here. Um, for those of you guys who are listening, if you know of people who have, uh, submitted uh, posters and authors have them follow me at um, at Dr. Raj Gupta. I'm going to be uh, posting my links um, that I want to do for tomorrow. Hopefully tonight. If not the latest, I'll do it tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, I, if you know, go click on those links. If you know the authors, tell them that we're doing this. Tell them to contact me. Direct message me on Twitter or um, uh, email me at raj.gupta at vumc.org. Either way is fine, and I'll try to coordinate them coming on the show. I'd love to have the authors present their poster. I think that's better, um, but uh, we'll keep trying to do it uh, as a team over here as well. Nabil, thank you so much. It's always easier to talk with someone than just talk by myself. Uh, well, thank you, Raj. I mean, this, is, this was great. Uh, the other thing that I want to direct the attention of your audience is uh, there are people who submitted actually video po posters and people with audio files, like yeah. some of the posters. And you can click these tabs and there's enjoy yeah, some yeah, of yeah. the video and the audio presentations. So this is the link. So um, ePostersOnline.com slash Azure Spring 20. That goes to the whole collection of um, posters. And um, from that, uh, many of the posters have multimedia um, uh, 
to contribute it to it uh, to their poster submission. So um, we are just touching the tip of the iceberg, and we would love for you guys to go and r read so many of the other good work done out there. And I want to emphasize this is just my quick selection of posters. This is not representing of what's better or worse. There's a lot of really good gold mines in that um, in that set of uh, abstracts. So go find those, and um, I, I think you'll find a lot. Um, it, it, Muhammad Lehman, uh, he said, need the details. I don't know which details um, you're referring to. I, if it was for the links for tomorrow's articles, I apologize. I just haven't looked through them yet um, and to, to pick out my picks yet. Just trying to juggle too many things at the same time. But I'll try to get those out as soon as I can. Nice. All right. And, um, you know, just because I worked on this, I'm going to put this thing back up here. Boom. So we have our banners and we look professional. Perfect. And uh, we're, so uh, tomorrow we'll be back 3 p.m. Eastern time. And um, just keep an eye out on my Twitter feed or the Azra Society Twitter feed, Facebook page, YouTube page. These will be all streaming live to all, all those locations at the same time. Awesome. Thank you. Everybody take care. Thank Bye. you, Raj.